Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> so, Chuck, welcome. Hello. We're here. We're live on the air, so to speak. At least we're recording. And yeah. but Chuck, I have every opportunity and option to spring unexpected things on you. And I have done that uh, several times in the past. I've just come to you at last minute and great expense is the fun phrase mm -hmm. and hit you with something that you were completely unprepared for. And those cold takes have actually been some of our most interesting sessions. And so I really enjoyed that. But I think today the shoe is on the other foot. Now, can I just can I kick it just over to you maybe and we'll kick things off and you can drive that portion of things? What were you thinking of today, my friend? It was maybe just doing something from the confessions, but you kind of left it up to me where to go. And so that's what I did. I What I did is I thought a little bit about what is one of my favorite sections from the confessions that, that I subscribe to. And then I thought a little bit about, I did a little bit of work in a book that is called Reformed Confessions Harmonized with an annotated bibliography of Reformed Doctrinal Works, which was edited by Joel Beakey and Sinclair Ferguson, so a couple of big names in Reformed theology. And what was interesting and I'll get in a moment to the section that I chose, and I'll explain a little bit why I chose it. But I expected that perhaps there would be a great deal of, within the confessions that are in this book, there might be a lot of harmonizing, and it would be interesting to compare where each of the confessions went. And I was surprised to learn that there's not much there. And now, some of it makes some sense. So what I did is I'm choosing a section from the Canons of Dort. And specifically, it's Article 16 in Heading 1 of the Canons of Dort. And the book that I've got, the Beaky and Ferguson book, what they'll do is on a spread of two pages, they will print sections from these various confessions that relate to each other. And on the page, they've got the Belgic Confession, they've got the Heidelberg Catechism, they've got the Second Helvetic Confession, the Canons of Dort, the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, and the Westminster Larger Catechism. And the section that I chose, and I'll just read it first, and then I'll get to a couple of the reasons. There's really two reasons why I chose this section. One is more content-related, which I think will become obvious as I read it. The other is more based on assumptions we make about certain confessions and how sometimes those assumptions can be broken down a little bit if we actually look a little closer in a way that may help us appreciate the various confessions. In any case, Article 16 of Heading 1 of the Canons of Dort uh, reads as follows, and I'm just going to read the translation that is in the book that I've got. In the Christian Reformed Church, we use a slightly more modernized version, but I'll just use the one that we've got. And it reads this way. It says, Those who do not yet experience a lively faith in Christ, an assured confidence of soul, peace of conscience, an earnest endeavor after filial obedience and glorying in God through Christ efficaciously wrought in them, and do nevertheless persist in the use of the means which God hath appointed for working these graces in us, ought not to be alarmed at the mention of reprobation, nor to rank themselves among the reprobate, but diligently to persevere in the use of means, and with ardent desires devoutly and humbly to wait for a season of richer grace. Much less cause have they to be terrified by the doctrine of reprobation, who, though they seriously desire to be turned to God, to please him only, and to be delivered from the body of death, cannot yet reach that measure of holiness and faith to which they aspire, since a merciful God has promised that he will not quench the smoking flat, nor break the bruised reed. But this doctrine is justly terrible to those who, regardless of God and of the Savior Jesus Christ, have wholly given themselves up to the cares of the world and the pleasures of the flesh, so long as they are not seriously converted to God. And what the reason, there's a couple of reasons, as I mentioned, why I chose this particular article. One, obviously, is there is a level of comfort in the article where in the midst of a section on election and reprobation, which oftentimes I think non-Calvinists twist what we Calvinists mean by election and reprobation into something we wouldn't necessarily recognize twisted into something almost like a, a God who is mean and only chooses a small number of people and often turns into a sense of how you Calvinists, you can't even know if you're saved. How could you live that way? And what the canons do here is they point out that that's not that realistically, even those who don't yet have a lively faith, who wish that their faith was stronger, who wish 
that their ability to live up to the way God wants us to live was stronger, but who keep stumbling because of sin, that even those of us in that circumstance, and to some extent, that's all of us, we don't need to fear the doctrine of reprobation, the doctrine that some will go on to eternal damnation because of their sin. And basically what the canons say there is that, look, if you're concerned about this, if you are trying to live a life the way that God wants you to live, and you're not succeeding, but you still want to, and you're concerned about it, in that case, don't worry about reprobation. Because look, what's happening is you're, you're experiencing in many ways the signs of justification, and you're experiencing maybe it's only in very small measures the experience of being reconciled to God, of sanctification, certainly in an imperfect way, but it is still happening. And I especially like that this is in the canons of Dort. And I think we've mentioned before, in, in my tradition, we subscribe to three confessions, the canons of Dort, the Heidelberg Catechism, and the Belgic Confession, in the backwards order of when they were written, often called the three forms of unity. And in my tradition, sometimes the canons of Dort get short shrift because unlike the Belgic Confession, and especially unlike the Heidelberg Catechism, the canons of Dort were written a little bit more, they were written by a committee. <laughs> they were written by gr groups of people who got together, to and they were written by people who were there to deal with a very specific issue and to controvert certain ideas. And so generally, it is less pastoral of a document than the Heidelberg Catechism or the Belgic Confession, which were written to a different audience and written for different reasons. And yet, in the midst of this fairly technical document that uh, goes through the various issues that were going on in, in the church in the Netherlands and in, in, in and around 1619, in the midst of this sort of dealing with those particular doctrinal issues, here is this beautiful pastoral section that says, hey, look, we've been dealing with these difficult issues of election and reprobation, and yet don't worry, if you're one of God's chosen people, it's going to show in your life. And it's going to show in your life by the very fact that you're concerned about reprobation. It's really those who aren't even concerned about it that we're mo they're most worried about it. And so that, that's why I chose that particular article. And I'll say that I have, in multiple situations, have been able to use that particular section as a way of walking alongside someone who was really having doubts about their faith and doubts about their faith because of their own understanding of their sin. And they would say things, and sometimes this was somebody live in person, a couple times it was also people that I just happened to meet through social media who would say, look, I just, I'm such a sinner, I, I'm a terrible person, I keep trying to avoid this or that other sin. A lot of times it's various kinds of addictions that, that have captured them in many ways. And they'll say, I don't know, I think I'm going to hell because I can't seem to get around it. And I would point to this section to say, look, the, the fact that this is concerning to you, the fact that you're worried about this is a sign that God ha is chasing after you with the hounds of heaven and is pursuing you. And by the way, God, when he pursues someone, he always wins. He always captures that who he is pursuing. And it doesn't mean that, that these folks that I've talked to didn't have to continue working at the issues that they had. They didn't have to, they had to do things to try to avoid the various addictions and problems they were having with sin. And uh, oftentimes, even some other issues, mental health issues seem to often play into that as well. But I found that this section from the Canons of Dort has been a great help to people. Now, I will say that, as I noted, I expected that in this sort of alignment, this harmony of the Reformed Confession, that there might be more there. And I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit, but I guess I'm interested, Brock, just how did you take and how did you experience just even when I read that article? I know that you don't subscribe to that particular Canons of Dort, but I know you're familiar with a lot of different Reformed confessions, and I wonder if maybe even it reminds you of anything from some of the confessions that you're familiar with or the confession that you subscribe to. Yeah, thank you, my friend, for this. And wow, you have really hit me <laughs> cold with a really interesting passage. 
And I want to get to my confession of faith and how, how I've seen this doctrine interact and interplay in the lives of believers and in my own life, in my own heart. But first, there was something that was very striking about this choice, and that is I hear, let me back up here. First of all, I'm fairly active on social media in some of these reformed circles. And so that means that I see a lot of posts from a lot of people. And I would say over time, maybe, I don't know, three or four times a year in the circles that I run in, I'll see some variation of posts from somebody that sort of goes along the lines of, can someone help me? I'm pretty sure I'm not saved. And we'll gently talk with them. Hey, why would you say that? Are you a believer? Do you believe the Bible? Do you profess Christ? And yeah, yeah, I believe the Bible. And I confess Christ, and I've been baptized. But I just don't feel saved. And first of all, that's a very insightful thing to observe, that sometimes we don't, quote-unquote, feel saved. Chuck, there's, in my own life, I can say that has at times been the case. I don't want to make it sound like it's often. There are absolutely times when I have not felt saved and felt quite the opposite. There's the famous text of people appearing before Jesus in the final judgment, saying, Lord, did we not prophesy, cast out demons, do good works in your name? And the Lord says to them, depart from me, for I never knew you. And that is, I think that has to be chilling to any person who's been a Christian for, for decades. So I'm in, <laughs> I'm in my 40th plus year of having been a Christian, and that doesn't make me anything special. I'm just saying that in 40 years of professing Christ, I have had a chance to actively not feel saved. And so when you read the first sentence, you said from the canon, those who do not yet actively experience within themselves. And I thought, wow, what a hopeful start. Because first of all, the key phrase there who is those who do not yet actively experience. And so right away, we're faced with one of the fundamental problems in epistemology, and that is turning what we believe or think we know to be true about the world and vetting it, get, getting through the things that are not phony. And for example, Chuck, suppose I grew up thinking that I was Batman. Now, of course, my name is not Bruce Wayne, and my gadget of my accessories for my utility belt are woefully <laughs> under, underrepresented here. But somehow I still think to myself, I'm pretty sure I'm Batman. What's going to happen to me one day? One day there's likely to be a crisis of experience. And one day I'm going to have to face the problem where I look at myself in the mirror and have to squarely face the fact that I'm not Batman. And I use this tongue-in-cheek glib analogy to try to deflect from the sting of this idea. It seems like a contradiction to the Christian experience that one could be indwelt by the very Holy Spirit of the living God and yet not feel saved. And so what a beautiful article. Now, I'm not going to, in this just initial opening, I'm not going to unpack everything. I think there's more to talk about here. But at least I just wanted to say, I feel the force behind this. I've experienced it in apologetics. I've experienced it talking with people. And I've even experienced it personally. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about, about what that means. But I just wanted to give you that quick feedback and run with it. Plus, I'm still, I'm still cold here, and i got to pull up my documents while you're giving me your response back. Probably not fair to tip my hand like that. But uh, how's that for an opening? How does that strike you, and where does it take you? I know that's great. I appreciate that, that response. And yeah, it's, it just it goes to show, I think, that we can get involved in thinking through all the various issues of salvation, and we can try to understand them and go through the order of salutis and all those kinds of things. And that's great. I, there's nothing wrong with doing that. But there's always, it's, this is a good reminder, I think, that there are always people who are dealing with these questions of assurance and these questions of what do I do about my own sin and recognizing sin and how do we handle that? Um, this particular section and the experience that I've had, even just as you've also described and just thinking through it in my own life, but then also applying it to others, is just really has been a good reminder to me that we need to always be pastoral in how we deal with people. 
Uh, and part of that it can really be helped by reading through these confessions in a way that's designed to be pastoral, it's designed to be helpful to people that get, gets beyond just simply the intellectual knowledge, but gets into that, that sure knowledge of saving faith that, that we have. Yeah, I appreciate that. One of the interesting issues that, that, and I'll just start with this, and it has to do more with, less with the specific content, which I'll dive into it a little bit more, but just, again, how do we harmonize some of the various confessions? And it's interesting to me that the first thing I did, so the book that I've got, the BP and Ferguson book that I have, does not have a, an index for each of the seven confessions that, that it uses. And so I couldn't just go to the back and find, okay, where is 116 of the Canons of Dort and what page is it on? I had to walk through it and try to figure out where is it. And the first thing I did is looked at the table of content. I saw there was a section on assurance. And that section on assurance comes after a section on perseverance. And I thought, for sure. Assurance, that must be where this particular section was going to be. And I looked at the section on assurance, and there are a couple of things that I expected to see there. The first question and answer of the Heidelberg Catechism, at least a portion of it, they list under assurance. What is your only comfort in life and death? And in the second part of that answer, it also talks about how by his Holy Spirit, God also assures me of eternal life and makes me sincerely willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. And I expected to see that. And there were some things that I'm aware of in the Westminster Confession and the catechisms that, that I expected to see. For example, in the Westminster Confession of Faith, there is a section 14 that talks about how this faith is, is by this faith we talk about a saving faith, is different in degrees, weak or strong, and may be often and in many ways assailed and weakened, but gets the victory, growing up in many to the attainment of the full assurance through Christ who is both the author and finisher of our faith. And then in the Westminster Larger Confession, or Larger Catechism, there are a couple of questions and answers, 80 and 81, which talk about, can true believers be infallibly assured that they are in the estate of grace and they shall persevere therein unto salvation? And the answer, such as truly believe in Christ and endeavor to walk in all good conscience before him, may, without extraordinary revelation, which I love that part as well, by faith grounded upon the truth of God's promises and by the Spirit enabling them to discern in themselves those graces to which the promises of life are made and bearing witness with their spirit that they are the children of God, be infallibly assured that they are in the estate of grace and shall persevere therein unto salvation. But then, question 81, are all true believers at all times assured of their present being in the estate of grace and that they shall be saved? The answer says, assurance of grace and salvation not being of the essence of faith. True believers may wait long before they obtain it, and after the enjoyment thereof may have it weakened and intermitted through manifold distempers, sins, temptations, and desertions. Yet are they never left without such a presence and support of the Spirit of God as keeps them from sinking into utter despair. And so knowing that those other confessions were out there, I thought, well, Article 16 of Head 1, of the Canons Adored is, is likely to be in that section. And as I searched around, it wasn't there. It surprised me. So I did a little bit digging further. And eventually, I found that what Beacon and Ferguson did is they put it in a much earlier section on God's decrees and predestination. And I think that's a reasonable choice. Maybe if they wanted the book to be a whole bunch thicker, they could have maybe repeated it again in, in the assurance section. But there are some really interesting things in other confessions about God's decrees and predestination. The Belgian Confession talks about eternal election and sin and how God in his eternal and unchangeable counsel has elected in Christ Jesus our Lord without any respect to works, just in leaving others in the fall and perdition wherein they have involved themselves and others. There are, there's a fairly lengthy Article 10 of the predestination of God and the election of saints in the Second Helvetic Confession that gets into these things. And then the Westminster Confessions often speaks of God's decrees, and as does the canon of Dort early or earlier on, it talks about God's various decrees, so not just simply election, but reprobation as well. And what's interesting is that what they've done then, Beaky and Ferguson, is harmonizing these confessions. They've chosen to put a whole se several sets of articles 
from the canons of Dort all by themselves in this section as sort of an exposition of these issues of God's decrees and a, a, a deeper exposition of it than what you get in some of the other some of the other confessions. And perhaps, again, uh, that makes some sense given what's going on at the time of the canons of Dort and the issues with the remonstrance, the Arminians who were complaining of certain reformed views. And so that those specific issues of God's decrees had to be dealt with. And there's a sense, I actually was talking to somebody about this, about why Beeky and Ferguson, at least, may have chosen to put the, the 16th article in this section rather than in the section on assurance. And one of the people I talked to was a little bit, I don't know, negative is maybe too strong a word, but he attributed it more to the idea that, hey, Reformed folks, we do tend to be very rational in the way we think about things, and so we want things to go step by step. And the Canons of Dort really was a step by step explanation of God's eternal decrees and the decree of election and the decree of reprobation and what does that mean, uh, and that you need to have Article 16 after a lengthy discussion of God's decrees, because otherwise you can get swallowed up in, in all that, in all that speculation about what might God be decreeing in this situation, what might he be decreeing in that situation, that you need to have this section. And so that, that was their reasoning for it being put there. And that reminded me of something that happened fairly early on in the time that I, that I was preaching. Remember, it's been almost, it's probably been about 15 years now that I went through a three-year course that our classes, our regional grouping of churches does to allow people to be licensed to resort and to preach, basically. And, and shortly after I had finished that, I took on an assignment to preach a series in my church, and I've used that series in some other churches as well now, but I, I took that opportunity to do a series on some of the basics of the Reformed faith. And in the first time I gave a sermon in that series on the concept of predestination, I remember it was a heady section, and just talking about what God's will is and how there's different kinds of, there's God's creative will, and he's different. I went through all of it. And after the sermon, an older man, not so old, about the age of my son, but actually probably at the time that he, that he came up to me, he's probably about the age I am now. <laughs> but anyway, he came up to me after church, and he said, it's a pretty good sermon. And this guy is, he usually likes my sermon, so when he just said, pretty good, I'm like, uh-oh, <laughs> what happened? And he said, I don't know. He says, you talk all of the stuff about God's will. And everything's in God's will, and there's these different kinds of God's will. And But how do you explain my brother? And his brother is also a member of our congregation. And at that time, his brother had just lost his daughter, uh, who died of cancer. She was about my age. Uh, and and so how do you tell somebody like my brother that this is all in God's will, that, that his daughter is going to die of cancer, having little kids, leaving behind a husband and these kids? How do you explain that? And I realized... First of all, I tried to give an answer using the stuff that I'd preached on, and it's God's will, and uh, he's not the author of sin, he's not the author of disaster, but a lot of times he can use these things for his good, and it's all true. And in fact, my friend said that. He said, yeah, that's all true. But how do you tell my brother that this is all God's will? And I was like, I don't know. And it was only, again, having the experience an experience like what I've described before of talking to somebody who was going through a real struggle about their own sin and going through this uh, Article 16, yeah, Article 16 of Head 1, once again, it actually brought me back to thinking about, huh, the will of God, we need to be more pastoral about how we even consider what the will of God is, and that it is, there's nothing necessarily incorrect about the various theories we have about how God decrees certain things to happen and that it's different than other types of God's will and our explanations for how God can be both sovereign over all and yet not the author of sin, but th that there is a sense that maybe our focus, even when we talk about these things, or at least if it's not our focus, it's something we always need to come back to, is the pastoral nature of this particular article. Here it's about assurance of faith, but it could really be about anything related to God's decrees. Uh, and those decrees can be about how do we deal with evil in the world? 
How do we deal with sin in the world? How do we deal with things like the death of a young mother with young children? Those things are in some way brought into God's will, and yet they are not the way God meant the world to be. Just as in some ways God now as a sovereign God, even though sin is not the way he meant things to be, even though our own rebellion against him that causes us to sin against him, and even our understanding of that is not how God wanted. This was not in his original order of creation. This was not how he wanted things to be, per se, but he still is able to use these things for his purposes. And and focusing again on, on God's love for us, on his care for us, on the fact that he has, in fact, uh, done all these things, in, to the, including sending his son, sending Jesus Christ to be a human on earth and to live in the very dust and dirt and grime of the sinful world that we live in, and to die on our behalf. And but that was part of, also, God's plan. And we can't forget that even in the depths of our own misery and in, even in the depths of our own sadness about things that are happening in the world, God experienced all that himself. The shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus, is so profound because it tells us how Christ himself, God himself in the form of the Son, experienced the same kind of loss and sadness and deep grief that we as humans often experience here on earth. And so he knows how we feel about those things. And again, to me, it's just a reminder of the importance of bringing these issues back to that pastoral and loving, graceful way of thinking about who God is and how he loves his people and how even these issues of salvation really are about God's work on our behalf. And that, it was an important thing for me to remember. And it was interesting then to see again and think through some of these issues again as I saw how Beaky and Ferguson chose to include that section in this harmony of confessions. They could easily have included it in the section on assurance, and maybe they, maybe someone else who does a book like this would do just that, and there would be nothing wrong with that. But it was just a reminder of some of those interesting discussions that I've had. In this. Amen, my friend. Amen. Boy, what a journey. I think maybe one of the first things I want to respond to, and I do want to talk about what my confession of faith has to say about that. I do want to get there. But I open things up by talking about how I would try to comfort the person who, you know, as I said, probably two or three or four times a year on the social circles that I run in, I'll see this question from somebody who professes faith in Christ and yet doesn't feel saved. And I think it's in the contemplation of this issue that we have to realize the outputs of theology are different, perhaps, than the outputs of philosophy or the outputs of an analytic science. And so when we think of things in a very analytic world, people want to ask me for proof. And in one sense, I don't have the kind of proof that they are expecting or demanding or insisting upon. And I don't think any Christian has that. Having said that, what do I have? And is it enough? And so I think what I have and what we as Christians have that we can offer our fellow Christians is not proof, but it is comfort. Now, how can you have comfort in something that's not proven or not demonstrated? And I think that I want to talk about how I will maybe feel out the problem space of the person who's the Christian who's concerned, don't feel saved. And so one of the things I'll ask is I'll say, let's start with something else. Do you believe that your mother exists? And I have never had anybody deny that one, although on social media, people will just take up a counter position just for the fun of it. But I'll ask them, do you know that your mother exists? And that's it. They'll say, yeah. And I'll say, how can you prove it? And we might get into some ideas. I could prove it because I could take a photo and have a photo of her. Or I, the experience of my fifth birthday and she brought my birthday cake out and people will start to talk. And what's my point? I'm not denying that the person's mother exists. I'm just trying to get us thinking about some fundamental basic things about life that we believe to be true that are even stronger than our ability to demonstrate. 
And so I think that's a good example. Does your mother love you? Okay, how would you prove that? It would be pretty difficult to prove in an analytic sense or in a scientific sense the way science is so often thrown about in conversations. And yet, for most of us, these are, these are things that are beyond doubt. And I don't mean that they're beyond doubt in that somebody's going to come up to me maybe later and say, oh, I had a mother and I'm not quite sure she loved me. Well, okay. But for most of us, this is a really helpful situation to think about something that's so fundamentally true from your own experience that it's not even doubt worthy. And then I want to consider that to the Christian, the promises that God makes in his scriptures are even firmer, are even better than those fundamentals. And so when the Christian who's not feeling saved talks with me, I will just ask in a tender way, in a probing way, but still one that's not trying to be argumentative about it, and say, did you read the Bible? Yes, they'll reply. Okay. Did you believe it? Yes. Okay. You believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the God, the Son of God who came to save sinners? Yes. Okay. Are you a sinner? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus died for you? Yes. Okay. What's the issue? I don't feel saved. And so then we start to explore that ultimately we this feeling of not feeling saved actually brings up an important issue for us to consider. Are God's promises better, stronger, more secure, certain, and reliable than even our own feelings? I'll talk with that person and I'll say, did you ever feel like you were saved? And they'll tell me, oh sure, yeah, I felt like I was saved. When I first got saved, I had joy, I had peace within, I had this, I had that, I had all these confirmations, I was reading the scriptures, and they were feeding my soul. And so then I, the question is, okay, you've felt saved, and you've felt not saved. What does feeling have to do with it in an ultimate sense? And I think we, as believers, get to that point. No, I have prayed on some occasions when I have, quote-unquote, not felt saved, my prayer has been, Lord, right now I don't feel saved. I feel like I'm the worst sinner on earth and that the thing you should do right now is judge me and find me guilty of my filthy sin and throw me into the divine fires of punishment. But yet, your scriptures give me promises that I can trust. Your scriptures promise that you care about me, that you have a concern for me, and that if I turn to you in faith, you will save me. I know that I believe those things. And so even if I don't feel saved, I'm going to look at myself in the mirror and live on the basis of those promises. And I think for the Christian, that's an interesting and hopefully somewhat satisfactory response slash stopping point. Now we've got another case to consider here, and that's when the person who's not a Christian has some of these kinds of feelings. And we'll talk about that because it has to be answered. But Chuck, what do you make of that? Is that barking up the right tree? What's the right way to, to square this circle of feelings versus faith and trust and promises and looking at one's self squarely? Yeah, I appreciate that. I really like how you use that approach of gently pointing out that our own feelings, that our own sort of experience of our feelings and can often be uh, mistaken, it, 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 and that really what we're relying on is the testimony of God's promises, which are can be trusted in all things. In fact, we may have these feelings um, that our assurance is in some way shaken or diminished, but none of that actually shakes God. He, as the creator and sustainer of all things, uh, nothing shakes him, nothing moves him from the course that he has chosen. And so Thinking back to the, that, that text, he who began good work in you will be faithful to complete it. And so if you've had some sense of that experience of certainty of salvation, if, it, if, that was, if there was truth to that, then God is going to, going to complete it. We can certainly have faith in that. Yeah, pointing outside of ourselves, pointing away from our own weaknesses, especially when we're feeling though that those weaknesses are, in fact, what is causing us to, to lose our assurance in Christ. A lot of times it is our own experience of our sin, of our weakness, that causes that. 
so it's actually rather brilliant, I think, to point out that same weakness that you're feeling that is causing you to lose your assurance of your salvation. That's, that weakness is also preventing you from seeing what's much larger, the bigger picture, which is that Christ is faithful, that God does persevere with his saints to the end, and that he doesn't give up on on us, on those he's chosen, and he's not, he does not have a lack of power where he can't stand up to whatever sin and whatever evil that he's facing you know, up against, that Christ has conquered it all through his death and then through his resurrection. So I love that way of really dealing with it. And in many ways, it's, yeah, as I said, it's brilliant to use even the own feelings of uncertainty that a person may be having to show that, hey, that that those feelings of uncertainty show that there is something greater that we need to rely on, and that is God's word, and that is God's promises. So I really do appreciate that and enjoy that way of thinking. So I know you are hoping yet to get to your own confession. Do you have any thoughts uh, on that? Have you been able to, in the course of our discussion, get to uh, maybe there is something similar, or maybe it goes in a slightly different direction, but something that gets at some of these issues of God's will and of, and of our assurance of God's will for us that you can point. Yeah, yeah. And really the confession says it better than I've said here. So it's really good to just maybe cite that. And so I'm looking at the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, chapter 18, of the assurance of grace and salvation. And I'm only reading portions of it here. And that's not to make my case seem better than it otherwise is. It's just to, it's just to try to give clarity about uh, the first use case here. So with that in mind, let me just read part of it. Chapter 18, Assurance of Grace and Salvation. Those who truly believe in the Lord Jesus and love him sincerely may be certainly assured in this life that they are in a state of grace. They may rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, and this hope will never make them ashamed. And so this is the, that's the first section. And so we hear that assurance is tied with hope. And what is that hope tied to? The hope is tied to the testimony of the scriptures that speak of the promises of God, the statements of his good will towards those who love him sincerely and truly. And so it comes down to what is stronger than our own personal feeling? And that has to be the promises of God. Now, section two continues. This certainty is not merely an inconclusive or likely persuasion based on a fallible hope. It is an infallible assurance of faith founded on the blood and righteousness of Christ revealed in the gospel. It is also built on the inward evidence of those graces of the Spirit about which promises are made. It is further based on the testimony of the Spirit of adoption, witnessing with our spirits that we are the children of God. And so this confession presupposes that there is God's Holy Spirit actively working to keep me, actively exerting and performing and doing the things that result in me being kept. What does the verse say? He who begun a good work will complete it in Christ Jesus. Did he begin? Sure. I remember being born again. I remember hearing the gospel. I remember believing on it. I remember coming to a new life. And those same scriptures have said to me, what God has started, God will finish. And wow, that is comforting. Now there's a third section here. This infallible assurance is not such an essential part of faith that it is always fully experienced. True believers may wait a long time and struggle with many difficulties before obtaining it. Yet, with the enabling of the Spirit to know the things freely given to them by God, they may attain this assurance using ordinary means, appropriately, without any extraordinary revelation. And so what that's saying is, Chuck, there's nothing special. I can pull out my copy of the Bible and read what it has to say, and there's nothing higher. Maybe I'm reading my Bible and I come away and I say, you know what, I'm saved. It's sweet. The promises are there. I'm convinced that God has authored those promises and that he's applied them to my benefit. 
And then somebody else walks in the room and says, aha, I have a true word from God. And he says, you're not saved. Where's the higher testimony? What is more believable? And I think we put, so remember, we're talking about the experientially minded. And you hear people say, I need to see it. I need to touch it. I need to feel it to be true. Everybody remembers the story of doubting Thomas in the Bible and how doubting Thomas said, I'm not going to believe what you other disciples have said about the risen Christ until I see him myself and touch his wounds. Now, in Thomas's case, the Lord actually accommodates him. But in our case, the Lord has asked us to trust, rest, and rely on his own word. And is that so unreasonable? We were talking earlier about a mother's love. And so suppose you're thinking about the love that your mother had for you while she was alive, and, or my mother while she was alive. And suppose somebody bursts into the room and says, I have it on good authority that your mother never loved you. Now, this is actually, a, there's actually a funny reference in here. One of my favorite con comedy teams, Chuck, the Smothers Brothers, used to do a sketch, and it was called Mom Always Loved You Best. And it was where one of the brothers accused and said, Mom never really loved me, Mom only loved you. And so this actually is a funny, interesting thing to consider in light of the, the comedic talents that the Smothers Brothers brought to the subject. But what's my point? My point is if someone comes to me and bursts in the room and says, I have it on even better authority, then, you know, we have to decide where is the ultimate source for knowledge? Where should I look? If it is outside of the scriptures, then who is going to read the scriptures and find them sweet to their soul? But we confessionally reformed folks say that if the scriptures say it, then it is to be prized as true, even if all other circumstances and people declare the same thing to be false. So let me finish up with this section here in the confession. Therefore, it is the duty of all to be as diligent as possible to make their calling and election sure. In this way, their hearts may be enlarged in peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, in love and thankfulness to God, and in strength and cheerfulness in the duties of obedience. These effects are the natural fruits of this assurance. Thus, it does not at all encourage believers to be negligent. And then finally, section four says, true believers may in various ways have the assurance of their salvation shaken, decreased, or temporarily lost. It may happen through some unexpected or forceful temptation, or when God withdraws the light of his face and allows even those who fear him to walk in darkness and to have no light. Yet they are never completely lacking the seed of God, the life of faith, the love of Christ and the brethren, sincerity of heart or conscience concerning their duty. Out of these graces, through the work of the Spirit, this assurance may, at the proper time, be revived. In the meantime, they are kept from utter despair. So Chuck, it might be dark at times. We may experience, and I can say after 40 years, I have experienced, and yet the words here in this confession are true. Even though I have experienced, it has never been, it has, I have not fallen into despair. And I've shared before with folks that I've come through stage four cancer, and I'm not trying to play that as a trump card, but I'm just saying I've faced some serious things in my life, and yet God has always proved himself to be true and faithful in the light of his scriptures and his promises. So what an amazing assurance we can have. How would you try to tie it all in a bow? Yeah, no, I agree with you that there is something really special about that assurance that we can have and that God gives us the means for that assurance. I was thinking as you re were reading that last couple of sections, talking about how it is our duty to give diligence to make our calling and election sure through these various means. And some of that is the studying and listening to the Word, but it's also the sacraments too. And that, that also gives us that ability of participating in the Lord's Supper is another concrete way that, that we can do that. And then there was one other thing, too, that I appreciated, and I think it is both a way that we can help work out making that calling and election sure, 
but it's also a grace that God has given us. When you, you read in, in that fourth section that we are never utterly destitute of the seed of God and faith, that love of Christ and the brethren, that sincerity of heart and conscience of duty. And, I, and as you're saying, that love of Christ and the brethren are of the people of God. There's a reason, there are many reasons that the church exists, but this is a key part of it, that God, when Christ ascended to heaven, he didn't leave us alone. He left his spirit with us, so his spirit is there. And he also left us his church. And the church is there also as a way of helping us to work through this calling and election. And the love of our congregations, of our church, of the fellowship of which we are a part, should be also a way that we can, something we can rely on, something that we can turn to in those darkest days when the light of Christ seems not to be falling on us, when it seems that we're walking in darkness, one place to hopefully find that light is with the brethren, with the folks that Christ has placed in our lives as part of the church, our family in Christ, and how important that really is. So I really enjoyed your reading that section and thinking about some of these practical ways that not only can we be reliant on God for our salvation and for assurance, but that, that he's also given us these tools to help us with that. Praise be to God for all of that. He's, yeah, he doesn't leave us alone in our misery, but is always providing ways for us that even in the darkest of times, we can live in the light of his promises.